thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much. Welcome to Science on Tap, Manaqua. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Susan Knight. I work at the University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station, um, up the road about 10 miles. Um, this is a, a big night for us here at Science on Tap. It is our fifth anniversary. Thanks to all of you. Five years of bringing science to the people in the Northwoods, uh, thanks to so many wonderful, generous uh, speakers. As promised, right after our speaker is done tonight, we will have Babcock ice cream for everybody, so don't run out the door, but you have to wait till the end. So we'll, it'll be a great time, okay. And just to remind you that Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, the idea that the borders of the university are the borders of the state, and that's why we get all these wonderful professors coming up all the way from Madison, all the way up here. And um, we started Science on Tap not to be a lecture, but to be an opportunity for you to hear about some science and then to ask your own questions. Um, I'd like to remind you about our sponsors of Science on Tap, uh, Trout Lake Station, that I, that where I work, also, Kemp Natural Resources Station, another part of UW-Madison, the Lakeland Badger Chapter, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, the Manaqua Library, Manaqua Public Library, and also our hosts here, the Manaqua Brewing Company. And um, we are funded largely by the Brittingham Fund, a fund on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus. So, and also a reminder that there are four ways to watch. You guys are all watching right now, right in person, that's great. If you can't make it in person, you can also go over to the library where Mary Taylor is streaming at the Manaqua Public Library. There are a couple of other libraries around, including the Eagle River Libraries also does the same thing. You can also watch from home. Just uh, go to our website and say watch live, and you can watch uh, from your own home. And lastly, we have a couple of ways to watch after the fact. We, have, we archive all of our videos, our, all of our presentations, and we also do a five to 10 minute short version so that you can, if you just want a little flavor. But if some of you are, are off in the, the boondocks or something, or down in Florida or someplace else uh, for part of the year, then you can still watch us then. So, um, our next Science on Tap will be presented by our own John Bates, I see sitting right here at the bar, and um, Terry Dalton. And they are going to talk about science and art. And so that should be a fascinating program, so I hope you all will come back in a month on March 7th. And another quick announcement. The Northwoods Wildlife Center is having a photography gala this Saturday at the Campanile Center from 6 to 8. So please check it out. And there's Courtney Wright. Um, there she is in the back waving her hand uh, if you need more information. So this Saturday, 6 to 8, the Campanile. Okay. So on to tonight's presentation. Tonight we have Dr. Tim Van Dillen from UW-Madison Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology. Uh, Tim grew up in Michigan between Grand Rapids and Holland, where all the small towns are named after provinces in the Netherlands. I never knew that. Uh, his interest in wildlife uh, ecology stems from his time growing up in rural Michigan and many hours doing what he calls Daniel Booning in the willow thickets and other local woods and wetlands. That's evidently a phrase right from the Sand County Almanac. He started out pre-med, few of us did that, as an undergrad at Calvin College in Michigan, but soured on the competition for grades. So he took all the non-pre-med courses he could find, and that led to a um, grad school position at the University of Montana, where he received his master's degree, and then on to Michigan State, where he got his PhD. Uh, Tim started his career as a research wildlife biologist for the Wisconsin DNR and the Illinois Natural History Survey. As I said, uh, Tim is now a professor at the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at UW-Madison, and he is CALS, that's the College of Ag and Life Sciences, Beers Bascom Professor in Conservation. He teaches Forest and Wildlife Ecology's course in Animal Population Dynamics, and he teaches the Wildlife Program's capstone course, which uses deer management as a case study. His research interests include the conservation and population biology of large mammals. He is also the faculty director for the greenhouse, 
an undergraduate learning community organized around the theme of living sustainably down on campus. And it's housed in a new dorm named for Aldo Leopold. So here's your trivia question. As a grad student living in a tiny field cabin, Tim had a small mishap. What happened one very, very cold winter day? A, he was making homebrew, accidentally tipped over five gallons of new beer, created a beer skating rink in his chilly cabin. B, a porcupine started chewing on the wood footing to the cabin. The cabin collapsed, and the porcupine's feet were all that could be seen sticking out. <laughs> or C, as he warmed up the cabin, a nest of snakes hibernating under the cabin woke up and crawled into his sleeping bag. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> that story is funny because <laughs> it didn't turn to ice. Uh, the cabin had, well, the cabin had uh, heating grates in the floor. And I saw the beer creeping towards the heating gates, and I thought, uh, this is really going to be ugly if all that five gallons of beer goes down into the heating system. So I threw every fabric thing I could find in the cabin into the puddle of beer. And as fast as it became saturated, I threw it out in the yard where it was about five below that night. <laughs> um, you remember felt packs, uh, boots that had these big felt liners? I was wearing those, and they got saturated. So I threw those out in the yard as well. I threw the rug, I threw the, uh, all my laundry, and um, a towel out into the yard. It all froze. I slept on the couch that night because I threw my bedding into the beer. I got up the next morning, all that stuff was frozen solid. I had a t-shirt and wool pants and my boots without the liners to wear. And I loaded all of that stuff, frozen like cardwood, into the back of a decrepit old Suburban and I drove into Escanaba to take it to the laundromat. And I bring it inside and it's thawing out and it smells like beer <laughs> and I'm standing there in a dirty wool dirty wool pants and a t-shirt, and there's yellow stuff beginning to thaw out <laughs> on the table. And no lie, the woman next to me putting laundry into the washing machine up in the UP looks at me and just kind of grins, and she says, yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> Well, um, this is, well, thank you, first of all. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is truly a, a delight for me to drive back up to um, Manaqua. I lived in Lake Tomahawk for several years when I worked for um, the Wisconsin DNR. My kids were toddlers at the time, and they played in the, room, in the woods. And it just, living up here was really one of the highlights of our family life. And if you talk to any of my kids, they will tell you that. Um, what I'd like to do today, and this is a high wire act, right? Because normally when I give a talk, I have a bunch of slides that I can show you, and I use those to cue myself. And it's really convenient because when you're talking about science, a lot of times you just forget stuff. There's so many facts to remember, and if you write it on a slide and point to it, you sound a lot wiser than you actually are. <laughs> so standing here without the slides is a bit of a high wire act. But this is going to be less about science, I think, tonight and more about um, Aldo Leopold maybe filtered through some of the science and experience that I've been lucky to have. The, the assignment that I really got grew out of um, some enthusiasm among the organizers for a MOOC that we did a few years ago. A MOOC is an acronym for Massive Open Online Course. And we did a MOOC that used um, the connections to Aldo Leopold and hunting as a way to promote the idea of a land ethic. And towards the end of the MOOC, we were talking about land ethical hunting. So tonight is going to be reflecting on some of that experience, um, uh, where that intersects with some of the science that I've been doing since I came to Wisconsin, and um, sort of the way that the thinking has developed in discussing this sort of stuff with 
colleagues and with students. Um, so we'll see. I got, I got three chunks here I want to try and get through. The first is I'm going to tell you about my introduction to a Sand County Almanac. The title that was promoted was The Long Shadow of the Sand County Almanac. And then, returning to the UP, I want to tell you about an Escanaba mailman that I knew. And then finally, I'm going to spill the dirt, and I'm going to tell you about the biggest mistake that I made when we put that MOOC together. So first of all, I graduated from Calvin College. Calvin College is a church-affiliated school in western Michigan. It's very conservative. Um, there's no wildlife program. There's no forestry program. There's nothing that um, a student could really point to that would have any of the applied natural resource management stuff that I do today. So I, um, I applied to a bunch of different programs. And I got accepted at the University of Montana, and I thought that wildlife biology sounded fun. So I got married. My wife and I uh, packed everything we had into an S10 Blazer. Remember those? And we drove out to Montana. Um, she had never been there before. I had been through on a family vacation back when I was in grade school or something. And I got to the forestry building, which is where the, the wildlife program um, was housed, and I was sitting in uh, the office of Dr. Dan Pletcher. Um, Dan is a wildlife professor at the University of uh, Montana. He's now retired. Um, he had uh, worked on deer in New Hampshire and then spent most of his career in Montana working with wolves and some of the wolf recovery going on in the, um, in the northern Rockies. But Dan set me down, and he began giving me the new grad student interrogation or interview that everybody gets. And I don't want to make this sound too overbearing because Dan was just a super nice guy. And you know, the dirty little secret is that grad school really is not that hard. You just have to refuse to give up and try something else. But, <laughs> but Dan said to me, I, and I, you know, this was about halfway through our, through, well, I shouldn't say it that way. We were about a half hour into the conversation, and, and the topic of San County Almanac had come up. Dan was a Midwesterner and uh, had grown up in Minnesota. So we talked about walleye fishing, and we talked about deer hunting. And we eventually got to Sand County Almanac, and he said, have you read Sand County Almanac? Clearly expecting that I had indeed read Sand County Almanac. Well, I hadn't. I didn't even know what it was. So I said, completely innocently, Dan, no. i sorry, don't know what that is. And he paused, and he stood up, and he said, come on, we're going to, uh, walk to the bookstore. And the bookstore was not far uh, from the forestry building. It's a small campus anyway. So we walked across uh, the mall in front of the bookstore. We walked into the bookstore and we found a copy on the shelf, a paperback copy, and he bought it. And he said, take this home and read it. And that was the only direction I really got from him. Because right after that, we began talking about what my interests were, what potential research um, I might do. And I read it. And I remember being amused. I thought it was interesting, but I didn't really grasp why it was important. And then I really will tell you that, you know, I, I got my education at Calvin College, but I learned my field at the University of Montana. I learned what it meant to be a wildlife biologist. And part of learning my field was sort of absorbing from other professionals and people who I would look to as my mentors on how important the Sand County Almanac is to people in the field of wildlife biology. And that's a strange thing if you reflect on it. Because in wildlife biology, we like to see ourselves, we like to present ourselves as rational, uh, objective scientists. Uh, we think that as wildlife biologists, our contributions to society is to provide the science that guides the management and conservation of animals. And certainly Aldo Leopold was a scientist. He was a professor at the University of Wisconsin. We even, in the field of wildlife ecology, we point to him and we call him the father of wildlife ecology. And we say, um, uh, as a legacy of that, one of the important principles of wildlife ecology is that management um, policy should be based on science. But the dirty little secret was 
that as important as the science might have been in the 30s and 40s when he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin, science moves on. Science builds on itself. And there really aren't a whole lot of enduring scientific contributions that would make Aldo Leopold the towering figure that he is in the world of natural resource management. And it, it might sound like heresy to say that, but it's really remarkable to me that how, how we've made him into an icon when really it isn't so much the science, but it's the writing. It's the ideas. And if you go back through Sand County Almanac, it's not so much even the ideas all the time, but sometimes it's the craft. It's the craft of what, using the language the way he does. And I suspect that there's an element of regional in, regionalism in this. Um, I'm a Midwestern kid. I grew up in the farm country of southern, Wisconsin, or southern uh, Michigan. And um, I hunted rabbits with a 20-gauge. And I roamed around in the woods in the wintertime. And I taught myself how to build a twig fire. And I did all this sort of stuff that he calls um, Daniel Booning in the willow thickets. And I think that that's a probably a, a very common experience for people who go into the fields of wildlife biology and forestry, is that we see ourselves reflected in the writings in the first part of San County Almanac, which are largely uh, life history, or rather, natural history descriptions. But you reread it again. And I, I remember a quote. Um, Jack Ward Thomas was president of the Wildlife Society, which is my professional organization. Um, he took that job after he had been chief of the national, U.S. National Forest Service, um, a towering figure. And he, he had a quote one time where he says that on his birthday, he rereads Sand County Almanac just to find out what he learned that year. The idea being that uh, professionals return to this little book, and you can read this in an evening if you want, but professionals return to this little book because there's, there's, there's a richness there that goes beyond the natural history, the science part, and goes kind of beyond the part that we find reflective. And so um, I'd like to explore some of that uh, with you tonight. Um, a bit of background, Aldo Leopold grew up on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River in Burlington, Iowa. He was a um, fantastic amateur naturalist. So uh, there are descriptions of him bird watching uh, with his mother's opera glasses, and he, he was fantastic at keeping track of phenology, so um, the timing of biological events, when the migratory birds returned by species, when they left, when certain things were blooming, when insects were available. He recorded all that stuff. And then he went to boarding school. Uh, eventually, he went to the University of, uh, well, he went to Ma uh, Yale University. And the other thing to know about him is he was this compulsive letter writer. Um, one of the really interesting things that I've done in my life was to sit down during a summer and read Kurt, read Kurt Miney's biography of Aldo Leopold because it's reconstructed from some of his letters, including the letters that he was writing back to his mother when he was an undergraduate student. And he would take these long jaunts away from New Haven, Connecticut, out into the countryside. He'd be gone all day, and then he'd come back, and nearly every day he would write his mother about this. And you can see in those early writings as an undergraduate two things developing, an eye for the natural history of the environment around him, but also the beginnings of a writer who writes because it's beautiful. Well, what was he trying to do? I think early in his life, he didn't know what he was trying to do. I think early in his life, he was like most of us early in his life, that we were pursuing some version of what we thought was either important to us at the time or what was going to be important to us. And there's a fantastic book that was written by a friend of mine, Julianne Lutz-Newton, called Aldo Leopold's Odyssey. And it describes this process of intellectual growth on the part of a person whose starting point is the bluff in Iowa and the birds and the flowers and all of this stuff that he was keeping track of. And it's this whole trajectory that eventually converges on the land ethic, which is where I want to end up tonight. But Julianne makes this really interesting observation 
And Leopold says as much. Leopold recognizes that the only way that we're going to really truly achieve conservation is if we change people's values. If we change the way that people look at non-human nature and the way they value it. And that becomes um, the basis, really, of, of the land ethic, which is one of the things that, outside of the applied biology professions, Aldo Leopold is the most famous for. And so I'll, I want to get to that. But the audacity of looking at the world and saying, we need to change the way that people think. Um, you might call it audacity. It might just simply be uh, boldness or... Um, to be less charitable, it might be kind of a pipe dream. But outside of this, his whole life he spent reconnecting with, out, with the outdoors. And you see portions of this in Sand County Almanac, and that was some of the stuff that we wanted to highlight for people who were taking the MOOC. We wanted them to make the sort of connections that I think wildlife biologists make when they see themselves in the writings of the Sand County Almanac. And so one of, the, you know, one of the, the readings that we had in the MOOC is a very short essay called Red Legs Kicking. And I'm going to find it here just a minute. In Red Legs Kicking, um, Leopold is describing... Uh, being a boy in Iowa, and he goes hunting, and he really wants to kill a duck, but there are no ducks around, so he stakes out um, a pond where there's a little bit of open water, and he sits in the reeds, and he decides not to shoot the rabbit that comes by, and it gets colder and colder and colder, and anybody who's been hunting in northern Wisconsin knows what this feels like. At some point, you wonder what's wrong with you. But he sticks it out, and eventually a black duck comes, and he makes the shot, and he's rewarded for um, the restraint on the one hand, not taking the rabbit when he had the opportunity, and the natural history knowledge that was there to be able to recognize when the duck came. Um, and he goes from there to talk about partridge hunting. So he's talking about hunting rough grouse. When my father gave me the shotgun, he said that I might hunt partridges with it, but that I might not shoot them from trees. I was old enough, he said, to learn wing shooting. My dog was good at treeing partridge and to forego a sure shot in the tree in favor of a hopeless one at the fleeting bird was my first exercise in ethical codes. Compared with a treed partridge, the devil in his seven kingdoms was a mild temptation. At the end of my second season of featherless partridge hunting, I was walking one day through an aspen thicket when a big partridge rose with a roar at my left and towering over the aspens, crossed behind me, hell-bent for the nearest cedar swamp. It was a swinging shot of the sort the partridge hunter dreams about, and the bird tumbled dead in a shower of feathers and golden leaves. And then he writes this paragraph. I could draw a map today of each clump of red bunchberry and each blue aster that adorned the mossy spot where he lay. My first partridge on the wing. I suspect that my present affection for bunch berries and asters dates from that moment. When I was in Montana, I had a friend who took me deer hunting. I had been deer hunting before, but I had no idea what I was doing. He taught me inside of a day and I remember that feeling when I killed my first deer. When it fell down the mountain, when I recovered it, I remember the celebration, I remember what that mountainside looked like. I remember the time of day, I remember struggling to get it into the S10 blazer. I remember taking it home and being a grad student, not having anywhere really to go with it. So I also remember the same friend teaching me on my knees in the dark of a cold garage how to bone out a deer on a blue tarp. And I remember wrapping that precious hard-won venison and putting it in the little freezer to feed my family. And the value of that experience 
really was not the 50 pounds of lean meat. It was really the experience. And one of the things that I learned in Montana from working with people like my friend was that there's this emotional connection to the animals that becomes a motivating thing. It motivates conservation. It motivates people to get into this field. It motivates the sort of research that we do. Most of the research that I've done and that I'll describe for you tonight ultimately comes from money that's raised by people who are seeking similar experiences. I also met a guy. I was doing beaver research in Montana. I had the best job in the world as a graduate school. Um, three of my four study areas were blue ribbon trout streams. And the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks gave me the old warden's truck to use. And I had a fly rod under the seat. And the intersection of those facts meant that I could park that truck on any stretch of river and fish by myself all day long. <laughs> But they introduced me to a trapper, a retired guy, a veteran. He was living on disability because after um, leaving the service, he worked in the woods uh, felling trees, and he got hit by a deadfall. And uh, he taught me to trap beavers. And he taught me so much about the life history of beavers that I couldn't find in um, all of the scientific articles that I was photocopying. Um, and it was great fun because he had, I was, I was putting radio transmitters inside of beavers. We were doing a surgery. That's how you do it. Beavers don't have any neck to put a radio collar on it. So you, so you do a, a, a surgery, and this is kind of an accepted technique, but you have to be able to hold on to the beavers somewhere. And he had built out of a greenhouse a beaver-proof pen. So he had buried like sheet metal around the end of it. And he'd put a number of beavers in there. And... To keep track of them, he used to paint their toenails different colors with his wife's toenail polish. <laughs> and he told me, he said, you know, you should, you should learn how to get a beaver out of the pen. Do you know how to get the beaver out of the pen? I said, of course I do. I didn't. I had no idea. But I walked into the pen, and I walked over to the beaver that I thought I wanted, and I grabbed it by the tail and I held it up at arm's length like this, and I walked back across the pen and gave it to him, and his eyes were this big. He said, you're really going to get bit sometime if you do that again. Um, okay. <laughs> Let me tell you about the Escanaba mailman. I did my dissertation research in the Upper Peninsula, in the central part of the Upper Peninsula. Um, it was an opportunity when I was in Montana for my wife and I to get back closer to family in Michigan. We were both grew up in Michigan. And so um, the, the Department of Wildlife Ecology advertised for a PhD position to study deer migration in the Upper Peninsula. And it was um, a, a partnership between a hunter's group called uh, UP Whitetails and the U.S. Forest Service. And the way this works was you had this... Um, hunter group and you had seasonal employment and so you had a bunch of people from this hunters group that were available to help you trap deer in the wintertime. And we'd trap the deer, we'd put radio collars on, we'd study their movements to figure out what the migration patterns were. Well, one of the volunteers was a guy named Don. Don was a retired mailman from Escanaba, which was nearby. Don had a hunting camp north of Escanaba. Um, and Don, Don was old already at the time. I think he was in his 70s. He clearly didn't have the mobility that a lot of the younger guys did. Um, <laughs> we should do a raffle. Okay, raffle question. In 1933, Aldo Leopold was hired by the Sporting Arms Manufacturers Association, Sporting Arms Manufacturers Association, to do a survey of the big game of the North Central States, so the Great Lakes states, the Midwestern states. He was hired to do this survey. There were only three predators that he felt 
were worthy of even mentioning in the survey. So the, the first raffle question for one of the Sand County Almanacs is, tell me one of the predators. Bears. Not bears, cougars. not cougars, Coyotes. not wolves. Coyotes. Not wolves. Nope. Nope. Fox. Who said fox? Predator. Red fox was one. The other two, crow and house cat. That's how far we've come since the 1930s in terms of rebuilding predator uh, communities in the, in the Great Lakes state. So anyway... My friend Don, who was in fantastic shape, <laughs> who walked circles around the younger guys in the snow, he was there every morning. Every morning. He was there every morning helping us to trap deer, to move the deer around. Um, he was the best volunteer in the world, always cheerful, um, always the first one out of the truck. He just clearly loved deer stuff. And he'd, you know, you'd ride around in the truck with him, and he'd tell you his hunting stories. He'd tell you about his camp. Um, he was a widower. Um, he would tell you about hunting with his sons, um, the sort of stuff that probably a lot of you are familiar with. Well, I finished up my dissertation. I uh, left behind my friends in the Upper Peninsula, and I was working um, as a biologist, a research biologist for the Illinois Natural History Survey down in Champaign. And I got a call from Don. And he said, Tim, this is Don. I said, hi, Don. And we caught up a little bit. He told me about the marathon he was going to run. <laughs> and, and he said, Tim, he said, I shot a deer that has really long eyelashes. And I said, that's interesting. He said, no, it's really, I'll send you a picture. A picture, yeah. He said, I cut the hide off and I mounted it on a plaque and I've been taking it to the UP State Fair. Okay. <laughs> so, he, so a couple weeks later, a Polaroid shows up and sure enough, he's got mounted um, in like a picture frame with kind of a, a red velvet background, the, the two, like the face of the deer that he dissected off and dried, and he had it mounted on this thing. And sure enough, they had these, they're not eyelashes, they're called vibrasi, but these long sensory hairs that were sticking off. And this was a lot of fun. So I said, I, I wrote him a letter back, and I said, Don, go to the drugstore and get a metric ruler and measure every one of those hairs and write it down and send it back to me. And so he did. He sent it back to me. And I, there's, there's, this, okay, so scientists are a little bit nerdy. You know, we, we get our brownie points um, and, frankly, our serious evaluations on the basis of the number of scientific papers that we can write. So Don sent me all the measurements, and I knew of a, a journal that published natural history observations. So... I worked that observation up into a paper on unusual vibrasi and other palage anomalies of white-tailed deer in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. <laughs> and I made Don the senior author. So in addition to all the accolades he got for being a fantastic um, volunteer, he now had a peer-reviewed scientific <laughs> paper in his name. Um, last time I checked, that paper had never been cited. <laughs> but it's also the only paper on vibrasi of white-tailed deer out there, so for what it's worth. But it makes the point, really, though, that we have, in, in the case of deer, we have this, fan, many people have this really impressive investment in deer, um, and it goes beyond 
the, just the amount of venison that you can get from that. And I look to Don as sort of the archetype of that. And one of the things that has been both rewarding and frustrating about being a professional wildlife biology is the fact that people care so deeply about these animals. One of the motivations for moving to Wisconsin, especially to northern Wisconsin, so I moved from Champaign, Illinois to Lake Tomahawk, Wisconsin. One of the motivations was when I was a wildlife researcher in Champaign, Illinois, my neighbors, the people I knew, the people I went to church with, they, they thought that what I did was kind of interesting but quaint, kind of quirky. When you talk about working with wildlife among people in Wisconsin, you sense that it matters to them. And it's rewarding to do work that other people find interesting and important and um, compelling enough that they'll come out um, on a cold Wednesday night and listen to a guy who didn't bring any slides. <laughs> but that also becomes a source of a lot of controversy. And as I think back on a lot of the deer work I've done, at, at the base level, there were two questions that motivates things. How many deer were there? How many deer should there be? And that's the source of an awful lot of controversy. And it, it turns out that Leopold was dealing with those same questions in the 30s and 40s, right here. It always impressed me with this. When I was working in the Upper Peninsula, studying the behavior of deer that were using deer yards. Deer yards are pockets of swamp conifer that have a lot of um, overstory cover. They act as, as um, wintering habitats for white-tailed deer, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But nonetheless, they're, they're islands of habitat on the landscape that you can point to that are very important for the winter ecology of deer. And the Forest Service had maps that dated back to the 1930s. And many of those swamp conifers were identified, those same deer yards were identified as deer yards you know, 50 years prior. Um, it's probably no secret to folks who are, are Leopold fans that um, Leopold, when he was a professor at UW-Madison, was arguing to, to reduce the deer population. What was being observed in the north, right around here, was a lot of starvation, a lot of winter starvation. And Leopold interpreted that as a deer population that was too high that was doing enough damage to its range that it couldn't carry the full population through the winter. And so he argued to have um, doe seasons at the time, which was hugely con controversial. And um, one of his key antagonists was the editor of the Lakeland Times, oddly enough. <laughs> but that stimulated his thinking. Having to defend his position in a public forum like that um, really forced him to think about what are we really trying to do in wildlife management? Why is it important? Why do people care about it? And if you read um, Kurt Miney's um, biography, you find that in 1947 and 1948, when he was actually articulating what became the land ethic in Sand County Almanac, he was embroiled Oh, excuse me, he was embroiled in what has become to call, have, have sin, has since been called the deer wars up here because of the, the controversies over the number of deer and the impacts that they were having on their habitat. And the remarkable thing for me, um, I showed up in Wisconsin about 2001, and I remember I had a meeting. I had a, I had a, I had to prepare for a meeting, and uh, Robert Raleigh, who was the the DNR's population biologist at the time, the guy who estimated deer numbers, he had sent me a PR report on um, uh, the SAK model. The SAK model is the mathematical model for how do you estimate deer numbers. The, uh, being a PR report means that there was hunter's money supporting the research behind it. And I remember sitting at a picnic table at a rest area cramming on this stuff so I wouldn't look foolish when I walked into the meeting. And that, when I got to Rhinelander, I was sharing an office with Keith McCaffrey, fortunately, so I could just kind of sponge all the accumulated knowledge that Keith had. But that became job one, is trying to explain population trend. How many deer are there? How many deer should there be? How does that change through the year? That became 
the motivation for much of the deer research that I did in the state. So I was involved with recently these big telemetry studies. Uh, one was in winter, one was down in Shawano, maybe you've heard of them. The motivation really was to get at the one unknown factor in that deer model, the buck recovery rate, which would be the pop... Oh, I'm going to get this wrong with Keith sitting in the audience. <laughs> it's the probability <laughs> that a buck who's alive before the hunting season shows up in... Uh, the registered harvest. Yeah, see? Um, and again, it points back to the importance of deer to people in Wisconsin and those key questions. How many are there? How many should, should there be? And it's really interesting to me that we're having the same fights. In the deer world, we're having the same fights. When I came here, um, I was a year too late to have done anything connected to Deer 2000, but I sure heard about it. Um, after Deer 2000 came the SAK audit, which was the very first uh, project I worked on as a brand new professor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, after the Deer audit became, um, uh, that morphed into eventually uh, the Deer trustee report, which is kind of structured how we're doing things now. And I'm not so sure anymore that I want to work on stuff that people find so important because it's frustrating to keep um, bumping up against these same sorts of controversies. <coughs> SAK. Do you want to talk about SAK? Do you want to get into the weeds here? <laughs> Sex age kill model. One of the real problems with estimating deer was we couldn't tell how precise our estimates were. That's a very complex mathematical problem. And I'm just going to leave this here because I'm so proud. One of my former students now has Robert Rowley's job. And this year, SAK estimates have an uncertainty measurement. I know that doesn't mean anything to you. <laughs> okay. Um, let me tell you about the biggest mistake we made doing the MOOC. Remember, the MOOC was, that's an acronym for Massive Open Online Course. And the genesis of this idea was I was on a trip um, in China. We were on a bus being taken somewhere to see um, um, some tour site. I was with Paul Robbins, who is director of the Nelson Institute, and Janet Silbernagel, who's a professor in landscape ecology. And um, the administration at the University of Wisconsin had put out the call among the faculty to do these MOOCs. MOOCs were, um, at the time, um, kind of a hot topic. Other universities were doing this, and it was seen as a way to raise the visibility of the university, the teaching, the research that goes on there. So um, kind of idly, uh, sitting in the bus, I said, you know, we could do one with hunting because hunting's kind of popular in Wisconsin and we could use that as a vehicle to talk about the land ethic. And then Paul Robbins went back and wrote a proposal and he sent it in and we became kind of the theme for um, the second round of MOOCs that the university was doing. And, uh, you know, this was exciting. This was exciting because this was something... Um, Hunting, Aldo Leopold, the land ethic, this was something that um, by, the t you know, by the time I was a professor at University of Wisconsin, I believed in. I thought it was important. I was no longer the grad student who thought it was interesting and fun to read, but didn't appreciate how important it was. By that point, I had read the land ethic, I had thought about um, how that really informs how we think about conservation, those sorts of things, and I was, I was eager um, to share that and I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if this would be interesting beyond Wisconsin. Uh, turns out it was. We had like over 1,000 participants in 100 different countries. So we got into it, right? And the university was putting its resources behind it. So we had people who um, were specialists in how to teach something in short video chunks. So they told us that you can't do a MOOC, you can't expect as a professor that you're going to get in front of a camera and lecture for 50 minutes and then put that up on the website and somebody's going to pay attention to it. She forced us to think about how do we condense things 
into 10-minute maximum, 10-minute little video vignettes to get our points across. And if you go back to the MOOC, you'll see that a lot of our videos are even shorter, five, seven minutes. And we had video people who were hired, people who, you know, most of us could probably read the owner's manual and figure out a video camera well enough to get some footage. But we had people there who were trained in this, who were specialists, who could put these together and edit it into something um, coherent. And we had archivists who were working with us. At, since we were doing something historical without a Leopold, we had people at the university who were finding the materials and securing the copyright so that we could put them on a website so that we could use all this stuff. And the thing I'm trying to impress you with is just how much effort in terms of people and money went into producing these things completely apart from the three faculty people who were providing some of the content. So the university really, really got behind this. And, you know, that's thrilling. And the MOOC was up, and uh, it was running, and we had people signing up, and we had um, these discussion sections. I don't know if some of you took the MOOC, but one of the things you would do is you would go through the lessons, and the lessons were readings or videos, uh, presentations where you would learn some material, and then you were invited to go to an online chat where you could ask questions and have discussions, and then uh, we as the faculty would take turns um, participating in those chat groups to keep the discussion going. The idea is that students would learn by processing some of this information together. And I remember the question that I got when I was moderating one of these things was, is the land ethic ethical? Is the land ethic ethical? A thing is right when it preserves the beauty, integrity, and stability of the biotic community and wrong when it tends otherwise. That's the statement of the land ethic, or cl sufficiently close to it. But the question that I got in one of the, the, one of the chat rooms, I wasn't prepared for. And do you see why this is a big mistake? We were doing a MOOC that was largely organized around an ethical principle and we didn't have anybody on the team who knew anything about ethics other than, you know, the sort of subjective feeling that we all have about what our own ethical stances, our ethical principles. I mean, I'd like to, uh, I'll just have to convince you maybe that I have some ethical principles and I think that I have them correct, just like you probably think that your ethical principles are correct, but there's this whole world of academic research into the philosophical field of ethics that we had completely neglected in doing a MOOC that was about a specific ethic. Egg on my face, I should have recognized that. And he made the argument, this, this person, he said, you know, part of the problem with the land ethic, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the beauty, integrity, and stability of um, the biotic system and wrong when it tends otherwise, is that it depends on this principle which says that man or human beings should be plain members of the biotic community. And Leopold argues about the, or, or writes about this in um, The End of Sand County Almanac where he says ethics is an evolving thing. And he says, you know, at one point in our history, um, slaves didn't have um, the same ethical standing as their masters. And as ethics evolved, we recognized that slavery was a bad thing and, and that they got the same ethical standing as um, uh, the slave owners and then slavery went away. And he makes this argument that, that ethics is an evolving thing. And he says the outcome of that evolution in ethics is now that non-human nature should have what amounts to what, uh, what ethicists would call a moral standing. In other words, non-human nature has a value quite apart from the value that humans attach to it. We would call that an intrinsic value as opposed to an economic value or an instrumental value. And I only know this stuff because that question sent me into the ethics literature so that I wouldn't look like a fool in the online um, discussions. Clearly this guy had thought about it. Um, I guess I confess this here, but truth be told, I did a little snooping on him based on his name, and I found out that he's another 
um, professor in Canada somewhere. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm no expert. <laughs> but his point was, if you adopt that point of view, eventually the interests of nature overtake the interests of human beings. If you follow it to the logical extension. And as I did my reading, as I was um, uh, cramming through the... Uh, academic ethical literature to figure this out, I realized that, that that problem that he raised has a name. It's called, um, it's called environmental fascism. This idea that eventually human interests um, become subordinate to the, the interests of non-human nature. And it turns out that um, this has been argued back and forth. And it gets into, to, and this is my filter, but it gets into a bit of a, a, a a backwater in the ethical discussions. It's, there, are, there, are, there are people who are trained ethicists out there who have written ringing defenses of, um, well, the land ethic against this idea of envir environmental fascism. And I only know that because I had to dig back into this. But, but one of the things that becomes remarkable is that um, I had thought, I had thought really that the nut of the land ethic was that statement. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the beauty, integrity, and stability of the biotic community and wrong when it tends otherwise. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about what did he mean by beauty, integrity, and stability? And I don't want to present that as a wasted effort because I think that, that, that that's a really important question to ask yourself. In fact, one of the defenses of hunting, and this is um, one of the books that we pointed to in the MOOC, um, basically goes into another branch of ethics, virtue ethics, and it mounts a defense, an ethical defense of hunting because of the virtues that it creates in people who do it. And those virtues um, align with those, those three principles in Sand County Almanac. So beauty becomes something called an aesthetic competence. <clears throat> Question for you. Do you think the aesthetics matter? <laughs> to the way that we manage wildlife populations. Yeah. Not? Uh, you hope not? Well, let me... Let me throw this out there. Virtually every jurisdiction where you have big game hunting has a law against something called wanton waste. What that means is, if I go out and I shoot a deer and I reduce it to my possession, it used to be that the instant that you put your tag on it, that the ownership of that deer carcass transferred out of the public trust and into your own personal, it becomes your property. It transfers out of the public trust, becomes your property. We don't tag deer anymore in Wisconsin, but at some point when you recover the deer that you shot, and let's just assume for the sake of conservation that you are hunting completely legally uh, within the bounds of the law. So you have harvested a legal deer. It's your property now. Under the law, you can't leave it in the woods for the coyotes to eat. That's wanton waste. And virtually every jurisdiction that manages big game populations has a similar law. You're not allowed to let that 70 pounds of venison feed the crows and the coyotes or melt back into the soil. Even though it's your property, even though it might be on your own land, it's against the law. I could go to the grocery store and I could buy an equivalent amount of USDA choice beef and I could take it out onto my land, and I could leave it there for the foxes and the coyotes. And nobody, I mean, that would not be against the law. Why is that? Or this reason. Why can't I shoot a deer with a 22? That's, for those of you who don't know, a 22 is a very small um, caliber bullet. It's completely capable of killing a deer if you're very careful with it. 
and, and it's sometimes been referred to as a poacher's weapon, but it's also a very common gun. A, virtually every hunter starts out some point with a 22 rifle, and a lot of kids shoot it. But anyway, the point is, you're not allowed in Wisconsin to, sh to hunt deer with a 22. Why is that? Well, right, so we do, it's an animal welfare thing, right? So we don't want a deer to die a bad death. Those are aesthetic judgments. <clears throat> and so even without, and I'm just going to assume that many of you <clears throat> are about where I was in considering this stuff, we have these ethical aesthetic judgment principles already in our hunting regulations. And the thing that, that has really kind of captured my imagination is I don't understand what the principles are, or at least I don't understand the consistency. We have different rules for different animals. Right? So 70 pounds of venison is somehow precious, where 70 pounds of meat from a coyote is not. Right? Why is that? That's a fascinating question, and it gets at how in this culture we value animals differently. What is the proper way to pick up a live beaver for that, what that Montana boy do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sorry. The question was, what's the proper way to pick up a live beaver? Um, the proper way would to be get it, get it into a cage somehow, because the other uh, uh, technique that I tried at the time was even worse. You know these snare poles? You, you slip it around the neck and you tighten it down. That's the closest I ever got to having a beaver bite right through my shin bone. But um, frankly, and you didn't hear it here, picking them up by the base of the tail worked perfectly fine for me. <laughs> Another question? Um, this is a, more of a, a statement. Um, I had put in a resolution to the Wisconsin um, you know, Conservation Council to um, minimize the effect of lead ammunition in deer hunting here in Wisconsin. It didn't pass this past year, but it will be going in again. So this kind of addresses some of your aesthetic questions, too, um, and the ethics of using lead shot, you know, in hunting deer when there are, you know, other safer alternatives. Um, I just wanted to mention it because I'll be putting the resolution in again and want to remind everyone that the Conservation Cong you know, Council annual meeting is always in April. So please, if you would like to support the resolution, please go to that. I do want to make just one other short comment. Susan, I promise it'll be short. Um, I had the great pleasure of living in Baraboo and working with Kurt Miney at the Crane Foundation. Um, but I also uh, housed a woman from Turkey who was translating a Sand County Almanac. She was here for her sabbatical year. If you ever really want to dive into the Sand County Almanac, talk to someone in a different language. <laughs> And have them read it and also, you know, try and interpret it with them. It was such, it was the most amazing summer of housing Ufuk and her translations into Turkish because of the, his writings, as you mentioned, are so, um, they're just so beautiful and it's very hard in some ways to, you know, translate that to another language. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to um, make that comment. Has your group decided what the desirable population of deer is in our state? That's not a scientific question. <laughs> it sounds like it, but it really, it really gets at how do you weigh the values associated with having high deer numbers, and, and deer hunters like to have high deer numbers, against the cost associated with having for lack of a better term, too many deer on the landscape. And those can be manifest in um, you know, damage to commercial timber, damage to cars getting um, collisions on the road, maybe elevated Lyme disease, um, uh, some of the things that are hard to quantify, like the, the loss of uh, biodiversity of forest floor plants. Um, when, when this kind of question comes up with my students, I remind them that 
The science only can tell you, describe for you what the effects are. It takes an ethical judgment to decide where you want to go with that information. One of my favorite parts about San Con the Almanac is when Elder Leopold was a forester out west and shot a wolf, and he arrived in time to see a fierce green fire dying in her eyes, and that changed his whole attitude. Yeah. Um, you read that essay, and he talks about this something that is completely apart from what the wolf itself was. And it's the something that I think really captures our imagination when we write, when we read that, that, um, that essay. And it's, it's really informative when you're dealing with a bunch of students because I read that essay with students to get them thinking about these, these bigger questions. And I ask them, what's the something? Why is, what is it about the wolves that really animates Leopold to the point where he could write a beautiful essay like that? Uh, this is a tough one. What was the most amazing, amazing thing you did in Burlington, Iowa? I don't think I've ever been to Burlington, Iowa. Well, I thought you were from. I thought you were from Burlington, Iowa. Originally. No, Leopold was. Oh, Leopold. pardon me. Champagne. What was the most amazing thing he did in Burlington? <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess I don't know the answer to that. We have a question online. What do you think should be done about the declining and sickly wolves on Isle Royale? Maybe you could give a little background. Uh, okay, so um, the wolf population on Isle Royale is dying out. Um, there's been too much inbreeding for too long that they're accumulating uh, evidently uh, deleterious alleles, and that's manifesting itself in poor reproduction, um, physical characteristics like extra vertebra and deformed vertebra, and um, you know, other skeletal problems that they've identified. And there's either one wolf left, or two wolves left, or maybe no wolves left. And the question that the Park Service is facing is, should they bring wolves back into the Isle Royale ecosystem? Um, the reason that that's controversial in the, park in the Park Service is because the Park Service has an institutional philosophy of basically saying, we're going to let nature take its course. So we're going we're to keep the human interventions to be as small as possible. Um, I was actually on the expert panel for the Park Service to evaluate this question. And I think the right answer is, and now I'm just speaking for me, I'm not speaking for the panel, but I think the right answer is to bring the wolves back. Because I think the Park Service really doesn't want to be dealing with the sort of cycling in the moose population that we had before there were wolves on the island. At the high point of the cycle, you would have a lot of, of moose that would be starving or half starving, a lot of damage to the forests. I think. Um, it's naive to believe that Isle Royale is this completely untouched wilderness. I think we ought to set, set aside our naivete and um, manage that ecosystem and, and, um, and have a sense for the sort of things that visitors expect. They would like to see something that's functioning better than cycling between starving uh, moose and very low moose populations. So I have a situation that I'm just curious on your opinion on. Um, this past fall, I had harvested a, a, a buck, and I was walking into the woods, and when I came upon the buck, it was clearly wounded, and there was two wolves that were trying to take the wolf down, or the deer down, and kind of talking about like what you had said about whether to leave, leave the deer for the wolves or harvest it on her own, and kind of that like in-between kind of situation, I guess. Um, just out of your curiosity, I mean, obviously I shot the buck down and took it from the wolves when the wolves probably 10 minutes later would have taken the buck down and eaten it on their own. Um, just out of your opinion, I guess, what, if you were in my situation, would you think you would have left the deer for the wolves to eat or would you have harvested on your own to take it away from the wolves on its own? I'd have taken the deer. And I'm, I'm not being funny or facetious, but 
um, I don't worry about the wolves being able to feed themselves. And I think, um, and, and I, you know, this is something that Leopold returns to, that humans are part of this ecosystem. And it, like I said, it's naive to pretend that we're not. And in your case, you know, you've got a very short opportunity to harvest a deer and put it in your, in your freezer. The wolves have the rest of the year to hunt. And as I said, they're pretty effective predators. They'll be just fine. Could you describe the research you're doing on the apostles? Yes. Oh. Right now, this is one of my favorite research efforts. We've been um, doing camera trapping in the Apostle Islands. And um, what we're finding is, on the bigger islands especially, we had the full complement of the native predators that you would find on the mainland. But we find we have reduced prey populations. And we're in the process of um, trying to estimate prey biomass. But on the basis of the raw data, it looks like um, the ecosystems on the islands are inverted. In other words, you have very high predator populations and high predator diversity, and you have relatively low numbers of prey, both in species and in absolute biomass. And that would be just backwards according to, uh, well, from what you would expect. And we think that, um, well, at least in, in terms of the carnivores, none of those islands are big enough by themselves to support uh, populations over the long term. So the fact that they're out there and persistent means there's got to be some movement between islands and from the mainland out to the islands. And we think for most of those predators, that probably occurs over the ice. So we're trying to figure out this three-way relationship between the size of the island, the isolation of the island, and um, the amount of ice that connects them over time. And I think there's some really interesting biology going on there. So. Um, another question from the uh, Olson Library. What is your take on CWD? I hate CWD. <laughs> uh, CWD is probably the wildlife management problem that's the biggest right now. Um, CWD is, is not behaving like other diseases that we're familiar with. We, there, we can't come up with a biological mechanism that's going to limit CWD. There's no immunity involved. Um, the, the weak amount of genetic variation is not sufficient to think that there's going to be an evolutionary solution. In other words, that, that um, a resistance is going to evolve fast enough to save the Wisconsin deer herd. Um, this is an epidemic that is happening in slow motion, but it's just rolling over the deer population. We have prevalences west of Madison where the adult bucks, one in four of them, is probably infected. And at some point, this is going to begin impacting the survival of adult deer to the point where the sustainable harvest is going to go down. In other words, the hunting opportunity available, even if you want to shoot deer and take the chance that one of them might be effective, the opportunity is going to begin declining. And um, there's been a lot of discussion about a proposal that's kind of well outside the box in terms of um, what's been tried before, but this has stymied biologists. And it's, it's, I think it is time to begin having the discussions about, okay, if we're really going to be creative, what can we do to get ahead of this disease? Because the alternative is it's, it's going to come north, um, it's going to decimate the deer herds at some point. It might not be in my lifetime, but it's coming. Question back here. Um, I'm probably going to just ask for your opinion, and you can decline uh, if you want. But getting back to the wolf uh, question, it seems to me the, you know, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, they've been experimenting with the right levels of wolf population as it relates to mule deer, elk, um, grizzlies, etc. It would seem to me that Wisconsin is a little bit behind that and then can learn uh, in terms of the proper population levels, the proper mix levels uh, based on what the western states are doing right and doing wrong. Um, do you have an opinion on that on what you think they're doing right and what they're doing wrong and how we can make sure we learn from that as we go through in Wisconsin? 
Well, yeah. Um, the difficulty there is right now we can't do the management experiments that we'd, we'd want to, right? So we had a couple of years where we had wolf hunt. Um, I was in favor of the delisting because I think that you need to let the Endangered Species Act work. But right now, um, the topic is so hot and it's so controversial. And part of that controversy is that people who, uh, this, again, this is, this is that, that controversy that stems out of how do you place a value on these animals? Where, where does the value lie? And th that is not a scientific question. But if you, if you can't manage the wolves, you can't experiment to find out what the successful strategies might be. And probably that's all I should say on that right now. The question is, do I think science can be the answer? It depends on what the question is. If you're asking me how many wolves there should be, that's not a science question. If you ask me how many wolves should there be to prevent them from going extinct or to prevent some other effect, that would be a question that um, you could lend science to. But then the argument becomes, what's the tolerable level of this or that effect? And that's, I think, where the real battle is. I mean, if your goal was to eradicate the, the wolf population. As a population biologist, I could sit down with my spreadsheet and tell you the most efficient way to do that. You had asked the question earlier if, you thought, if we thought aesthetics should be part of the management plan. I, I don't know your exact words. And I'm the person who said, I would hope not. And I was relating in my own head the whole idea of the wolf population now and the view of the public that there should be three deer on every ridge side looking at you at night in a, in a picturesque bad landscape and reality of nature is something different where there are cycles and the wolves are stronger at times and if we weren't here and it not interfering and other times the deer would be up and my, my point when, with my comment was is that I, I actually think that there's too much human determination of aesthetic rather than nature determination of aesthetic. I, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, but we, we seem to want our picture to be the right picture, and the right picture is different than nature in my mind. So I'm just curious what your opinion is of that. Well, to be perfectly truthful, I'm struggling with the difference between a human aesthetic and a nature aesthetic. I mean, humans are the ones who make the judgment. And the study of aesthetics comes Okay, so then the question, who are we to make that judgment? We're, we're, we're really, we're just part of nature. Why are, why are we the ones to make that judgment? Oh, well, we can't help it anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not being flippant, but we, our activities affect everything either directly or indirectly. We are, we are forced, in, if we're going to have any semblance of, of nature at all, we are forced into the, ro into the role of being a manager. Um, scientists have given this a name. They, they say that we're living in the anthropomorphocene or something like that. Um, it's a, it, the idea is that we're in a geological epoch where the, the, um, the controlling influence on all of nature is the behavior of human beings. And the, the best illustration of that are the effects of climate change. So, like the question about Isle Royal wolves. Isle Royal is, is no longer a pristine functioning wilderness. It's completely, well it's not completely, but it's substantially influenced by, by human activity. And I think we have to own that. I think we have to take the responsibility and, and then as a consequence do the hard work of um, having the fights over the, the ethical questions of how should it look. I, I don't know if I even got close to question your question. Okay. Yeah, I read the okay. before, but it's complicated. And all I'm saying is that you put it into the CWD argument. Um, 
people want deer to hunt, put it big into the CWD argument, people want deer to hunt. Uh, and people still feed deer in their backyards, which exasperates the disease. If we had a perfect world and we had this little island that we could test this, how would the wolves handle the CWD condition and how would that help the deer herd in the long term? Not six months, not six years, but in 60 years or in 600 years. Yeah, there's, there's a reason to believe that wolves can be selective in identifying and removing sick deer from the landscape. But there are practical problems with having that be your complete management approach. For one, um, it'd be a long time before the, the, the raw deer population in our, in our um, CWD zone would get low enough that the wolves could control it and then remove the disease. The, the math for me doesn't work out. Yeah, but in the North Woods it might. It might. And, and that experiment is happening as we speak now that there have been positives detected in wolf range. And, you know, if, if I were given complete control over how we do this, I would want it to do some research to find out just how selective can wolves be. There's, you know, wolves are cor coursing predators. There's literature out there on the behavior of predation which suggests that wolves test their prey and that they're, they're sort of fine-tuned by evolution to identify the minutest impairment, the stuff that you and I wouldn't recognize from our tree stand. Um, that's an interesting question, but right now, I'm not aware that there's any data to address it. No, but we're very willing to, not we, John Q. Public is pretty willing to allow a wolf hunt statewide, where in, what I'm saying is in some areas they may very well be a very important part of the ecosystem, including up in the North Woods, for the long-term health of it. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. I don't know how to address that right now. From what, And by the way, I hunt, so... <laughs> Just so you know. Right. Question online? Yeah, another question online. What do you think Aldo Leopold would think of our management of deer populations today? I think he'd be astonished at the number of deer that we harvest every year. I think he'd be astonished at the density of deer in southern Wisconsin. Um, I think he would be astonished at the way that the farmland habitat has recovered. And I think he would be frustrated that we have these persistent arguments about how many deer there should be. <laughs>